Thank you, Sammy. And I think to uh, begin with, I have a lot of other people to thank. I mean, I'm listed at the top here, uh, but the, you know, the plain truth of this is that there are a number of people. I've highlighted uh, some of the key people that continue to be helping with this uh, as we try to pull together this understanding of the, um, what we call the census of deep life. Um, and I would, uh, I would say also there are a number of uh, census of deep life investigators that are not listed here, but that uh, contributed samples that, that we have analyzed during this time. And also the number of agencies and organizations that have supported the original sampling efforts, uh, none of uh, wh which all contributed to the collection of the samples. Um, and in many cases, some of the analyses. Um, I've also noted here, uh, or I will note, that many of the people listed are uh, early career scientists. And I, I thought, well, gosh, they're almost all early career scientists except um, me and Mitch. But if you remember the very first presentation this morning, uh, Liz Cottrell finished by asking uh, you, all of us, I guess I should say a question, she said, who was the early career scientist who asked for the soccer ball last night? And that was me. So I, I am, Liz, thank you. I am also an early career scientist. OK, that's as far as that goes, I think. So. All right, let's see. So the census of deep life, um, this is a, uh, an effort to define diversity in this deep biosphere that we've been talking about. And what we really want to do is characterize the, diver the, the diversity of deep life in continental and marine subsurface environments um, using high throughput DNA sequencing techniques that have come about in the last couple decades and continue to be improved. Um, this, this developed out of a uh, workshop in March 2010, right at the advent, maybe the origin of the Deep Carbon Observatory, and it continued until uh, a little over a year ago. And since that time, we've been doing some resequencing, going back to the freezer and resequencing. In total, there were 135 projects that were supported for this effort, and um, it, it involved a lot of uh, scientists who were perhaps graduate students or postdocs as uh, the lead PIs on these short proposals to have uh, sequencing done. And the basic idea was that the applicants to these proposals could write a short proposal, and I should also thank the reviewers, four of which are here in the audience, that routinely through these 10 years would drop everything, maybe not immediately, and review the proposals that had been submitted. So Tom and Mitch and Beth and Steve, thank you very much for that. You don't have to do any more, I think. Um, and so the successful proponents would then send their DNA and uh, would have the, the sequence data then provided back to them after it was conducted at the Marine Biological Laboratory uh, where Mitch works. And so this uh, complicated slide showed us, sort of shows a, a timeline of the... Uh, of the project across the top from 2011 to 2019. I think the key things are the boxes that are in the middle uh, that represent the projects that were actually funded. And you see we had at the very beginning 17 that were started in the beginning. That's right there. And then after a year or a couple of years, we, we managed to expand uh, so that it was no longer just 16S sequencing, which indicated uh, information about the individual taxa or the species, if you will, that were present in the samples. But then we were able to do so-called metagenomes on a few samples, which uh, intensively sequences, or you get more sequence data, so you actually get information on functional capabilities of the community. So there was that split there at that point, and then those were the offerings the rest of the time. And uh, this all tallies up to about 135. Uh, this just shows meetings and workshops that we carried out along the way, and uh, maybe more for my sake than anything else, uh, an indication of when we had uh, proposal calls and when they were reviewed. Uh, 
so this is a map. I think Mitch showed it uh, yesterday or the day before that shows where yeah. these samples came from. Uh, all over the world, of course, uh, the white dots being the terrestrial samples, the black dots being the marine samples. Is it? Okay, great, thanks. Okay, better? Okay, thanks. Um, okay, so one thing that's true with these uh, systems is that they're very low biomass in almost all cases. Uh, this isn't what you would consider a great place for most microorganisms to live, and so the biomass is quite low. Maybe they've died off on their way there. And um, that ends up being an issue when you're doing some of these sequencing studies. So when we started to look at the data, um, almost certainly we understood this would be the case, and it was, that there were a lot of contaminants that came perhaps from the drilling process, perhaps from the handling in the labs, that sort of thing. But the, the great thing about this was a paper that came out a little over a year ago that Cody Sheik led on, um, where we were able to look carefully, patiently, at the, uh, the census data as it was coming in um, and determine which samples were likely contaminants, either perhaps by virtue of uh, being contaminants from previous studies of the subsurface or possibly known human uh, microbiome contaminants. And so you can see perhaps that uh, a lot of the database has these things, but if you know where they are, then you can spot the, uh, the blank areas here, not the gray bars or the pink bars, and the blank areas are where the, uh, the data are good. And so this was helpful to us because then we could move on to what's happening actively right now. And again, uh, I'm presenting it, but these are data that are being developed really by a group of people. Emil Ruff has, has worked on this data quite a bit, uh, looking at the, the two basic groups of microorganisms that were sequenced in these samples, uh, either the archaea or the bacteria. And one thing that was uh, noticeable in this, so on this axis we see observed ASV, amplicon sequence variants, which is uh, microbiology speak for uh, different taxa or different species of organisms. Uh, there are a lot of samples considered here, so each one of these black dots represents samples that were in the database. And what's interesting is that for the archaea, uh, they are significantly more dominant in these marine systems, the, the blue bars, uh, compared to the terrestrial systems. Whereas for the bacteria, they're roughly equal. And this is interesting because in many other systems that have been studied, bacteria are typically dominant. Okay, if uh, we look at an NMDS plot showing the same data sets uh, but in this case, this is again archaea and bacteria with the blue dots shown as the organisms or the samples that came from marine environments, whereas the gold ones are those that came from terrestrial environments. For both archaea and bacteria, there's a clear separation of uh, grouping, meaning these communities are different depending on whether they were uh, originated, whether they originated from marine environments or terrestrial environments. And we had hints of this early on, but I think we're actually coming to the point of, of understanding this or recognizing that it's the case, that it is the case. So these data then show uh, um, metagenomic data, and I mentioned this uh, a little bit earlier, that there was a point at which we were able to sequence a limited number of samples for metagenomic information, so get whole community sequence information, which says something about the functions of the microbes in these samples. So 164 of these, um, and we actually, interestingly, see generally similar patterns to what we saw with the 16S. Uh, for instance, that the archaeal diversity is greater in marine than in terrestrial. So this seems to be reinforced here. Um, there's a greater variability in the patterns uh, that are shown in the archaeal uh, system, here, shown here in a principal components analysis, than uh, for the archaea that are present in terrestrial systems. And uh, this shows generally that there are certain differences in the, the uh, taxonomic abundance 
of uh, different organisms or these so-called ASVs that were found in the, in the samples. Uh, Jerome also notes that uh, this is similar to uh, the profile that you saw yesterday uh, indicating the degree to which mineral samples have been thoroughly sampled in, in, on Earth. And, and this indicates simply that, that we're not there yet in terms of exploring the, uh, the genomic variability or diversity that's present in, in these samples from a metagenomic perspective. There's still more diversity to be realized. But interestingly, here, the functional, there's functional redundancy across the, the biome. So even though uh, for functional characteristics in the metagenomes, there's an overlap between the marine and the uh, terrestrial systems, uh, functionally, they, they span the same space, which means that there's functional capability that should be redundant. Okay, this is kind of an interesting pattern. Uh, one of the things that we're still working on in small groups at this meeting is to consider the environmental data that goes along with all of these samples that were collected. On one hand, some attributes are easy, like whether they are marine samples or terrestrial samples, or seemingly easy. But um, other things are harder to reconcile. And what this shows is what uh, Karen Rogers and Fang Huang have put together in terms of uh, progress for data science. So all along this uh, axis are different variables that we've asked uh, individual PIs to collect, and here uh, sample IDs. So each one of the bars, the vertical bars, would be uh, an individual sample collected by the census investigators. And you can see they're not completely filled in. We're still working on doing this. And little groups of us who are uh, scurrying about, maybe trying to even get answers from people now, are trying to fill this in. OK, so just to summarize, uh, we, we do see in this database um, uh, a number of interesting things. First thing I would like to point out, this is a remarkable and unique database. It's, uh, it's larger than any other that has ever been collected on subsurface systems. And, and for many uh, large-scale surveys, it rivals those as well. Um, and so it's, it's really a unique resource that has been created. We're the first ones to explore it, I think, but others should be able to do this for quite a while. Uh, it does show that so far that marine and terrestrial systems are distinct from each other that um, the metagenomic patterns are similar to uh, what we see at least uh, in defining the dis those distinctions, the marine and terrestrial distinctions, similar to what is seen in the 16S ribosomal DNA. And yet, we also see uh, functional redundancy in terms of the capabilities of some of these organisms. Um, the, we're, we're still in the process of seeing past the low biomass or the contaminants in the system. However, that's something we know how to cope with now, I think, because of uh, Cody's paper. And, um, and also, we're in the process of continuing to uh, collect and archive this environmental data, which is not always um, a pleasant activity, but um, we try to remain collegial about doing it. And I think there are a lot of stories that will continue to come out of this. So thank you very much for your attention.